Welcome back or welcome to the Time Crunch Cyclist. I'm your host, Coach Adam Pulford. It's only ironic that during the week we recorded the Aging Athlete Podcast with Joe Friel that Mark Cavendish became not only the second oldest rider to win a stage in the Tour de France, but he also broke the record for the most stage wins with number 35, beating out Eddie Merckx, who had the previous record. And he did this at the age of 39. Now, that's not very old in many people's books, but for an elite athlete, it's old for sure. In addition to that, USA Cycling reports that the majority of their membership is between the ages of 35 and 54. In a recent article from Triathlete Magazine, it was reported that new triathletes are getting older. And in regard to all endurance sport participation in general, quote, older is younger these days, end quote. Personally, I coach athletes anywhere between the ages of 15 and 71 years old. And when I'm out at the races, I do see the 50 plus age categories as one of the biggest groups. And it's also one of the most competitive. It's fantastic to see. So there's no doubt that in the U S and I'd argue the world that people who are athletes want to keep being athletes, no matter how old they get. There are some implications to this, as you heard in part one of this podcast series, such as you don't recover as quickly at age 55 as you did when you were 25. That seems like common sense, but for many, it's hard to figure out the right balance of training and recovery as you age. So how should you train as you get older? Let's listen to the rest of the conversation I had with Coach Friel, and I think you'll find some rich takeaways that you can apply to your training as you age up and still perform to your full potential. As I kind of dove into um, the stuff you preach in combination with just general training principles, we look at the age, the, the complications of aging and the trainability of any age. And I kind of came up with four, four things that our audience can really take away. And you've actually hit on the first one and that's be consistent. Second one is keep intensity, but increase recovery time. Third one, stay motivated. And the fourth one, develop or keep good habits. So if we can swing to be consistent first, talk a little bit more there, even though we've touched on it, I do think that this is the greatest af- asset that any athlete can have. So speak a little bit more to consistency as it pertains to an old athlete. Yeah. One of my favorite sayings is, um, you, if you did the wrong, the wrong workouts consistently, you'd be, you'd be better off. than if you did the right workouts inconsistently, um, that's how important consistency is. Um, you can do wrong stuff and come out better just because you were consistent. That it's, it's the bottom line for improvement. I, in this new book I'm writing, I devote um, quite a bit to, to this, that topic alone is how to, how to, how to be consistent in your training. And this gets into lots of stuff. Um, we mentioned lifestyle or I did earlier. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really a part of it is your lifestyle. That's, that's what comes down to do you train consistently or not. It's not just motivation. Motivation is good and we need motivation. That's, that's not a bad thing at all. But the problem may be sometimes that people's lifestyle just gets in the way. They just cannot train consistently because they just got too much stuff going on in their life. When I take on a new athlete or in the past, when I've taken on a new athlete, um, one thing I always, one question I always ask is, how much sleep are you getting? This is very telling for who this athlete is. Um, if I find an athlete who's saying they're getting less than seven and a half hours a night, which is not unusual, I've run into that, to that a lot. An athlete is getting a lot less than seven hours a night of sleep. And I, I know there's a problem. And this this is really the, the crux of, the, of what we're talking about right here with consistency. What this means to me is the athletes has got too much in their life. They're trying to fit too many things in. Uh, the more stuff you got in your life, something's got to give someplace where most people take away the time is from their sleep. That's where they cut back on, on what they do is they, they sleep less. Therefore they can do all these other things they've got in their life that they, they have going on. When I run across an athlete like that, I, what I tell them is if you want to train consistently and you want to improve, what you have to do is have only three things in your life. You can have your family. We're not going to give up on your family because you're trying to become a better athlete. We're not going to change your give give walk away from your career. You've been at this for a while now. Let's, let's keep your career going, and you can train. That's it. Those three things. 
As soon as you start adding more things onto this list, something's got to give. And the first thing is going to be sleep. Sleep is going to impact your consistency. You're just not going to feel like it some days. You're going to be tired. And that's going to impact your decision to go out and, and work out. Or one of these extra things you get in your life besides those three is going to call on you that day to put some time into it. So what we have to do as we as we age up, and sometimes 50-year-olds are the worst problem for this, by the way. Because yeah. when you're in your 50s, what's happening when you're in your 50s is you move to the pinnacle of your profession. Mm -hmm. If you're in, in, a, in a company, you're now in management. You're not just now, you're not just, you know, typing in a computer all day long, typing in code. What you're doing now is you're managing the company. You're, you're, you're a big shot. And you've got a lot of things in your life. And so these things get in the way sometimes of getting your bike ride in after work because somebody wanted to talk to you for an hour and a half after work today. So there goes your, your ride. So you've got that. So 50-year-olds are the worst, I found. Once you get into your 60s, typically things begin to cut back. We begin to cut things out of our lives because we realize, you know, life is not going to be forever. I'm now 60 years old. I don't know how much more time I've got, but I need to do things, more things with my family that I haven't been doing in the past. I need to ride my bike more than I have been doing. In your 50s, you're not quite to that decision point yet. So sometimes I think 50 is the is the, the the most challenging age group there is for the athlete who is uh, trying to train consistently and improve at a level that will bring them to uh, um, a pretty high performance someplace that later in their in their in their season. Yeah, for sure. And there's two examples right now. Uh, two two of my athletes. Uh, one is uh, 45. The other one is 49. It's, just, it's the same challenges right now. They both want to improve. They're both time crunched. So overall, when we speak to consistency for both of them, I said, Hey, let's take these 350 hours of training that we did last year, roughly for both of them. Let's increase by 10 to 15%. One of them is doing it very well. The other one is not. And it's exactly why it, it, for the reasons that you said, got the promotion at work. He's in charge of a lot. He's got a family that's still fairly young and he's very active in that. And so we've had to shuffle training down in order to get that done. However, when you're consistent and you've increased total volume, especially over that long time period, no matter that age, you're racking up just time in zone, time in zone at all the intensities, but especially like endurance in that zone too. And that's going to really move the ship. And that's what we're talking about, about staying consistent over a year, over five years, 10 years, whatever. And then the shuffling of your, of your, uh, priorities. I agree. I mean, I, I've never heard it said any better family career training, and that sets up how you should make decisions about your lifestyle. You know, whether you go, <laughs> I don't know whether you're involved in all the community activity things, whether you go clubbing at night, whether it, whatever it is, right. If it doesn't fit into those three things, if you want to be good at training and racing, I typically find you need to be pretty focused and you need to align your lifestyle with it. No question. Yeah. Um, I've, I've gotten this all the time with athletes. Um, athletes are, are unique people. They, they believe they can handle a lot more than what they are already handling. You know, I've had athletes come to me who said, you know, they, they're, Turning, wanting to win a, a podium at the national championship or, or whatever it may be, a very high goal. And they say, you know, I'm thinking about become, joining the, uh, becoming a member of the HOA here in my community so I can kind of help out because they, they need some help. And, you know, I'm thinking in the back of my head, man, that's, that's the last thing you need to be doing right now. If you want to get on the podium in nationals, you do not want to become a, a, a politician and, and start trying to deal with HOA problems. And that's going to chew up a lot of your time. You need to cut that out. I, I hate to say it, but you know sometimes you just have to say, "I cannot be involved right now." Let's put this on the back burner till next year. You know, eight, next year after you've made the podium at nationals, then let's go join the uh, HOA and help them out in any way you can. That'd be fantastic. I'm glad to see you do it. But this is just not a good time for it. So something's got to give someplace, and you're, everything's going to give. Your family's going to suffer because of it. Your career is going to suffer because of it. 
Um, your training is going to suffer because of it, and the HOA is going to suffer because of it, because you just haven't got enough time to do everything that you want to do. There's only so many hours in the day. Let's spend more of that time just enjoying life instead of doing all this stuff. Yep. Yep. Agreed. And I, I think what you just made mention of there too, like the delineation is, do you want to be on the podium at nationals, right? That's a performance goal. And that's going to require serious training. It's going to require intensity. So one of my points was let's keep intensity in there. I, I don't find that my athletes decrease intensity at all, but I definitely shift the days where they do intensity. And I definitely shift um, how we pattern intensity. So can you speak a little bit to what you would advise for uh, an aging athlete uh, of doing hard days and easy days and maybe some patterning that you've found to be successful. Yeah. This is, I've, I started working on this idea. It's been more than 10 years ago, especially for, and I started working on it because of aging athletes. I've, I've come to realize you don't have to be old to, to, to change your aging, your, uh, your training pattern for sure. But one of the ideas that came up with, um, this is back in about uh, 2012, for older athletes was that they should train on nine day week instead of a seven day week. So they train one day hard and then two days easy, one day hard, two days easy, one day hard, two days easy. That's nine days. That's their week, if you will. And that way they get, they get adequate recovery if, so they can come into the next hard workout and actually make it a hard workout, a high quality workout. Uh, the problem I ran into with it was those who are, like in their 50s and 60s, not retired yet, especially 50s, uh, they couldn't fit into their lifestyle, you know, because they've got to be at a meeting at 7 a.m. in the morning at their at their job, and yet they're supposed to get in a four-hour ride that day. Uh, so it doesn't work. So I started playing around with what, but it works very well for retired people. If, if you don't have a job, if you don't have your days kind of laid out for you in a seven-day pattern, a nine day pattern works really well. You can change, you can do this one day on, two day off thing over and over and over. And it gives you great, a great recovery. And you come into each of those hard workouts ready to go. But the, the problem is the, is the uh, all the issues that you face with the, your lifestyle and trying to fit around in nine days. The other, so I'm sort of working on what's, how's a, what's another way of doing this. And so what I came up with, and this really came from looking at polarized research uh, they they never really, you know, they talk about 80-20, but they never really put it in numbers. What does that mean other than 80% easy, 20% hard? What does that mean in terms of your seven-day week? Because 80-20 doesn't work out in a seven-day week very nicely. But so what I started playing around with was 5-2. Mm -hmm. Five days easy, which could include a day off if you wanted to. That'd be one of those easy days. And two days hard. And separate the 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 uh, two hard days by either two or three days. So you've always got a gap between those hard workouts. Uh, so you get a chance to recover before you do it again. And um, so I started playing with that and it worked really well for the, for the aging athletes that I was working with. So I decided to start doing it also with my younger athletes and lo and behold, they got a lot more out of it also. So it, you know, they got a lot more volume out of this. We, we can do a lot more zone one, zone two churning, aerobic churning, metabolic churning, we can do a lot of that with this 5-2 idea, and yet we can still get in two hard workouts a week. And as I read more about from the research that Stephen Seiler and others have done on this topic and, and talk to coaches who have been following uh, uh, this with their athletes, their, their um, elite athletes, uh, you know, podium level athletes and grand tour athletes and such, they're doing something very similar to a 5-2 uh, training pattern. So... Uh, that's what I do now for all the athletes I work with is we, we do a five, two, we do five days a week, easy and two days a week hard. And I think it's a good way of uh, making sure the athlete is number one, getting uh, uh, lots of aerobic training and also being able to come into a hard workout and make it really hard. When I have athletes doing three hard workouts a week with only four easy during the week, it didn't work out nearly as well. Sometimes they'd come into a hard day and they were still tired from two days prior to that. I seldom have ever seen anybody come into that same situation now when we have a five two tech pattern. So I, I believe something like that solves a lot of problems for the athletes and we can get a lot more training done, a lot more 
quality training and a lot more volume done also because of that. So now I recommend that for all the athletes I, I talk to. Yeah. I, I think that that is a wonderful way of doing it on the podcast. I, I give recommendation of you basically have two, maybe three of your highest quality, or two or three of your uh, weekdays to be reserved toward high intensity or something that's going to move you forward in, in fitness. And so my question to you is when we're talking about high intensity and you say two days, would you also have a day in there that is higher volume and maybe like hard, but the intensity is lower or are those two days strictly reserved to intensity? Yeah. Those two days are strictly intensity. So when I say intensity now uh, with cy road cyclists, for example, especially mm -hmm. I'm talking about zones four and five, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's high intensity. Zone three, I put a lot more emphasis on that during the, the base period. In the base period, I'll actually change, I'll actually train the athlete pyramidal four mm -hmm. and three. Four yeah. easy days, three moderately hard days. Because they don't really have that, that problem with really trying to bounce back from a zone three workout, for example. Yeah. So we'll do a lot of zone three stuff, even some low zone, easy zone, um, uh, moderate zone four stuff in the base period. But once I get into the into the uh, the build period, the specific preparation period. Now I'm doing five two, so we're only doing we're doing two hard workouts a week, and they're high quality. Otherwise, they're going to do some long rides. We're going to maintain mm -hmm. their their um, aerobic fitness or base fitness that we got established during the base period. We're still going to work on that, but those those are not challenging like they were in the base period. The base period, you're just doing your long rides for the first time in the season. We're establishing that fitness. By the time you get to the specific period of training, you've already got that established. Now all we're trying to do is maintain it. We don't have to go out and do those grueling hard rides in, in low intensities that are just based on you know being out there for four or five hours, whatever it may be at a time, which very few athletes do, but there are some who are still to do that. That can be done if you've already got that build up originally. Now all you're doing now is maintain it. So as I stick with five, two, once I get into the specific period of training. Yep. I just wanted to point that out because as you're shifting through, you know, base build and uh, kind of like peak time periods, it's important for people to understand too, the intent, when we say a hard day, what that means. And there's times and, and places to kind of block things up three days in a row. Even if the intensity is not all that hard, it might be a little, the the session might be challenging, but the intensity isn't so much that we're not going to recover fully for the next day, but I, I would agree five and two golden recipe for when we want uh peak fitness and coming on to that kind of race form. Mm. Um, so e even with that five and two for 50 plus still works for 50, 60, 70 year olds. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. No question. Perfect. I'm 80. It works for me. One thing that you mentioned, um, either in your book or uh, some presentation where I was, was recovery on demand, which is also something I do with my athletes. It's a little bit more artsy rather than science. Could you speak to what recovery on demand is? Traditionally, what we've done is we've scheduled recovery periods, rest and recovery periods, like every second or third or fourth week. So the athlete gets a chance to uh, kind of uh, shed some of the fatigue they've built up over the previous period of time. And then you're going to be ready to go back into um, um, a nice high intensity, high uh, volume training again, following that, that that brief brief break from training. Um, and so I've kind of looked around at, at what is a better way of doing that, uh, because sometimes the athlete doesn't even make it to their third week and they're already tired. So you have to kind of like throw in, a, all of a sudden throw in a rest period for them because they're just carrying too much fatigue. And most athletes won't even, won't even tell the coach when they're feeling, experiencing that. The coach has to kind of like dig that out of the athlete to find out. That's one of the reasons, one, one of the, the benefits of face-to-face -face coaching, even using Zoom. Face-to-face -face coaching allows you to really see what the athlete is experiencing in their, in their churn. How do they look? Uh, back in the 80s and 90s when I was coaching athletes, early 2000s, we didn't have anything like that, like Zoom. And my athletes were all around the world. I never got a chance to see their faces. I never got a chance to see what they were telling me with their body, their body language. You know, that, were they expressing fatigue to me or not? They were telling me they felt good. And they were ready to go. 
but sometimes I would doubt that just because of tone of voice. But if I could see their face, if I could pat them on the back and see how what they're experiencing right now, I could probably do a much better job of making sure they're they're ready to go. So that then brings us to this idea you brought up, which is recovery on demand. If I was if I was the coach coaching a group of athletes face to face. I would every day walk up to every athlete, look them in the eyes and talk to them about how they're doing. How are they feeling? And I want to see exactly what how they respond to that question. And then I'm going to make a decision right there on that at that moment, whether or not they need to rest right now or not. Can they go ahead and do this workout today or do we need to start a recovery period? That that would be as if, if I was coaching one on one face to face. There's not a lot of that going on anymore. Very few coaches it seems are doing that. We're all using training peaks. We're all using Zoom. We're all finding other ways to uh, talk with our athletes, which is great. Much improvement over when I was doing this back, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But we don't get that same reaction, the same sense of what's going on with the athlete. We can't really experience what the athlete's experiencing. We can't see it. We can't. We can't feel it. So now we have to leave it up to the athlete to make these decisions. So recovery on demand leaves it up to the athlete. What it says is you decide when it's time to take a break. And that would be the, if, if everything else was equal, that would be the best thing we could possibly do to have you ready to start training again is for you to decide I need to take a break and I need to take, you know, we'll, we'll take a break for three days and see how I feel. And at the end of that three days, I'll decide whether to extend it or I'm ready to go back to it again whatever it may be, but I'm, I'm doing that based on me, my head, not the coach. The coach may be giving me advice, but I'm deciding when to do this. And I would love to have the athlete do that. The problem is most athletes won't fess up to it. They will not say I'm tired. They will not say I need a break. Um, they're just very reluctant to, to tell you that. So the coach has to in, in our new modern world of coaching, the coach has to dig that out of the athlete. We have to ask the right questions. We have to really go deep into understanding what the athlete is telling me and take it to a, hot, to, to a even deeper level than what the athlete thinks they're even telling you. You're, you're trying to get down to their core. Exactly how are they feeling? And, and you have to realize the athlete's going to lie to you. So you have to be prepared for that and just keep on going. Just keep digging down into it. And if you can do that, then it works really well for the coached athlete. The uncoached athlete, the self-coached athlete, it's extremely, extremely difficult to get that athlete to take a break on, on demand. Um, almost impossible. Um, they will hold out till the very end. Tell you a story about this. Um, I started coaching an athlete, I think it was about 1990. Eight, he was a triathlete, and um, he he called me one day. I knew who he was. He's a pro. He called me one day and said uh, he'd like to talk with me. So we arranged to get together in a coffee shop. He lived not too far from where I live, so he came up and we 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 spent some time together, spent a day, an hour together. And um, what I learned was he was tired, and he had brought his training diary with him, which is usually a bad sign. Um, that meant he was really tired. He wanted to show me something I knew. Um, so I started asking questions. And what I found out was he had, he had fired his old coach something like uh, eight weeks prior to when we met. And he decided to coach himself. And he decided he could actually make himself a lot better than his coach could if he just didn't take any breaks from training. If every day was a hard workout, he could, he could be a much better athlete than he was. He was already at the top of the sport. He was chosen by the USOC as the triathlete of the year. Um, he, was, he was top five in the world. He was one of the best athletes there is and what was in triathlon at that time. But he decided that he could be even better just by not taking a day off. So for the next seven weeks, he had something hard every day. He'd work out with a group of runners who were doing a race-like 5K workout one day a week. He did a swim workout with the, the three days a week with a with a master's group that um, uh, featured really high-intensity workouts. 
Um, he was doing bike rides with uh, uh, cycling groups that were pushing the limits all the time. Every day was a hard workout. And he got to the point by the seventh week, he was having a hard time getting out of bed. That's when he called me. And we met and I knew exactly what was going on as soon as we started having this conversation, just by the tone of his voice, just by talking to him. He was way, way overtrained. He was, he was the most overtrained athlete I've ever come across in my entire career. It was just amazing what he was going through and what he was still pushing himself to try to do. He was in his eighth week and he was embarrassed that he couldn't finish off this eighth week. All he wanted to do was eight weeks of, of nonstop everyday hard training. And now the eighth week, and he couldn't hardly, he couldn't do it anymore. What's wrong with me, Joe? I, I can't do this. There's something wrong with me mentally. And so I said, no, it's it's not mental, it's physical. And so he asked me if I if I would coach him. And I said, yes, but you got to do what I tell you. And you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you. We're going to take some time off. We're going to stop training for a while until I know you're recovered. That may be, I don't know how long it's going to be. It could be two weeks. It could be two months. I don't know what's going to happen here because this is, this is rare when this happens. You've pushed yourself to extreme limit. So we started down that path again. That's that's from that point on. Um, he finally got him back into training again. Didn't do anything at all that year. He had a bad season altogether. You know, this is top five in the world. He was having a hard time uh, of staying in the top ten. Um, he goes on to the next year. He wins one race because we changed his our philosophy of how to race. He got one race win, which was really great. He was trying for the Olympics, um, and I knew the bottom line there was he was not going to make it. He came close. There were three uh, three athletes who could make the Olympics that year from, from the U.S., and he came in fifth in the, in the trial race. So he got close. This is two years after this overtraining bout, and he was still experiencing the downside of it. The following year after that Olympics, he retired from training, he retired from racing, and he still had years he could have gone on had he not done this to himself. So he ruined his career by, in, in seven weeks, he ruined his entire career as a, as a pro athlete. In seven weeks, that's how important this is, but you cannot make the athlete understand that because they believe it's in their head, as he thought. It was something going on between his ears that kept him from pushing this last week hard. What was it that he needed to work on mentally to do this? But it was physical. It was all physical. He just run himself in the ground. So recovery on demand is a great idea. It's hard to get people to do it. Really hard. It, it is. Um, part of the part of my process in, in doing it, I'm a firm believer of teaching them how to fish rather than giving them the fish. Like teach them how I think. Teach them why I do what I do, right, with their training. And it typically goes better. However, even with when I give a lot of autonomy to my athletes in that way, they they still want to check in with me. And I think that I think that's healthy, but they've already they've already made that decision in their head. They just need a little bit of confidence in, in that way. And I think it also that speeds up efficiencies on both ends because as you said, remote based coach is not in the field with you. You need to be able to make some decisions when I'm not there. And we need to be able to trust ourselves that we'd rather underdo it a little bit rather than overdo it by a little bit. And that's going to give you greater success in the long run. And so for any self-coached athlete listening to this, I mean, you listen to that story, you listen to my philosophy. It's just like under train yourself by 10% rather than over train yourself by 1% because the over training part's going to go real bad. It is. I ran into a coach, a friend of mine, coach, um, who has a unique idea, somewhat along the same lines as what you have. He gives the athlete seven days of workouts or whatever it may be, and here's the package. You decide when you're going to do them. So from day one, he starts giving the athlete control over their program. It's not being dictated to them. They're deciding, making decisions on when to do these workouts. And I think that's a good starting point for getting to the point where the athlete can actually make a decision on when to take a break from training is to give them the opportunity to uh, uh, to coach themselves, if you will, to some extent, to get, to get the guidance from the coach. But but they're now making decisions on their own about when they're going to uh, do those workouts. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I think every coach maybe does a, a little differently. 
Um, I would say I'm always observing and, but I have a high trust with the athlete. And if there's a problem, like I'm always, I'm going to reach out to him if I think that there's going to be a problem, things like that. But I do think that, and I don't do this with everyone, but I do think that there is time and place for that. Um, especially when you're getting to learn an athlete too, and they're trying to learn themselves. So, um, in that way, I mean, I, we, we've talked about motivation, generally speaking, the athletes I'm working with, I don't have to kick them in the butt that much for motivation. They're generally highly motivated, but not always. And if, if we're staring down the, the double barrel of aging and all of these things that we talked about, I'll never be what I was in my twenties and thirties. Why am I even here? Why am I even trying to do bike racing or triathlon or running or what? How do I, how do I get motivated through that? How, how have you motivated your athletes through that, Joe? Yeah, that can be a problem. Um, I, I talk about uh, statistics with, with athletes a lot, uh, all the data that we look at. One of the most important data I, I look at them with, or look with them at rather, is uh, something I call the efficiency factor. It's just a way of looking at how aerobically, how the aerobic fitness is coming along. And I call that EF. So we talk, we talk about EF all the time mm -hmm. when talking with athletes because uh, it's so critical to their uh, building their, their performance from the base level on up. But I came up with another idea here not too long ago uh, about EF. It should really be called the enjoyment factor. Uh, I want to want to find out from you is how are you enjoying your training? Are you having fun? Is, if this is not fun, then we need to make a change. Something's not right someplace. What can we do to make it fun for you? Maybe that means, uh, you know, athletes like to ride with, especially cyclists, like to work out with other cyclists, like to ride with them. Group rides are popular because it's a social time for a lot of athletes. It's time to get together and, and, and you know, just have a good time. Do we need to do more of that? Uh, do we need something? Do, do, do you need a training partner? That's sometimes the thing that gets them motivated also. Is, do you need a training partner? Uh, somebody that's going to meet you every day you know, at, uh, at the intersection that, and that's near your two homes so that you can do a ride together. Maybe that would help you. Um, or if the athlete doesn't have a coach, one thing I'll recommend doing is getting a coach. That, that's one of the biggest uh, motivators there is, is to have a coach. So if we can get the athlete to, to realize I'm doing this because enjoyment, it's, it's fun, and then start doing more stuff that's fun within my training, that becomes then, I think, a motivator for keeping the athlete um involved in the sport instead of deciding they're going to give up because I'm just not what I used to be. You have to realize that's that's what's going to happen. The numbers are not going to stay the same as they were when you were in your 20s and 30s. You're not going to see those numbers anymore. They're going to go away. By the time you're in your 50s, that's history. Now we're talking about a new set of numbers, and you have to be prepared to deal with that new set of numbers and realize this is how you perform right now, and there's nothing wrong with those numbers. That can be very good numbers still for your age group. That's that's important, but you've got to, the first thing is you've got to enjoy riding your bike. You've got to enjoy working out. And if you're not enjoying it, then we need to find something that helps you enjoy it. That's that because my job as a coach then is to find this thing that helps you become um, better at, at, at enjoying going for a ride every day. What, is, what does it mean? What, what do you have to do? It's a, it's a challenge, I understand, but it, it's one of the most important things there is, is to, to keep on doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years and enjoy it all the time. Every time you go out, you get a kick out of it. I, I you know, maybe that means getting a new bike every every year or so to give you something new to ride, just to kind of keep your enjoyment level high or turning partners or all these other things I mentioned, but you got to do something to kind of keep the enjoyment high, external or internal. Yeah, um, agreed with that for sure. And I think that sometimes it is taking away some of the structure. Like we said, like for, like if they're not motivated to go out there and, and hit intervals and, and charge hard and, and stick to a pattern sort of training program, it's like, take the structure away, just kind of like, let them be, let them go, keep consistency. And then you start to add in these other flares of social, um, some other challenges. There's always something to work on efficiency factor, smoothing, pacing, the, all these things. And so I think, a a, a coach, you know, somebody who's kind of a, a third party unbiased to look in and just give those slight tweaks at the right time. That's the way to do it for a self-coached athlete. My general advice is, yeah, probably chill out a little bit more um, 
<laughs> do less structure, just do some endurance and give yourself some time away from a high performance or high pressure sort of situation. And that's, that's definitely going to help in, in the motivation side of things. And then start to think big, like, um, you know, if you do love, you know, riding and racing your bike, um, you know, book something in Europe, you know, do a do Swiss Epic, you know, do, do different things and different disciplines to start to change it up. Cause you've, you probably find that it's like, oh yeah, I just needed to a variety. It's actually a principle of training as well as the spice of life, but it, it, it really plays a big role in, in motivation. Agree. So my last, my fourth and last one here is keeping good habits. This is the boring stuff. This is the sleep, the nutrition, the hydration. And I think we can, we could probably talk at length as we have, but I was thinking about this too. And, and Joe, you got some personal experience with this. A lot of aging athletes, they may have some major surgeries or injuries. So how do you keep good habits after a major surgery? And tell us a little bit about kind of your journey that you're on right now. Yeah, as I mentioned a little while ago, Adam, that uh, back this is it's now uh, uh, June. Back in April, I had two surgeries in three weeks. Um, wasn't any fun at all. It's, it's a very difficult time for me. I wasn't able to ride my bike, lift weights, or do anything. And it had been a long time since I'd been through a month without doing anything at all. So I got back into it when, was, when I finally was able to uh, move around. I started moving around more. I started walking. First, first walk was just around the block. And then I started walking farther and farther and farther until I was walking uh, an hour and a half at a time, several times a week with shorter walks on the other days. So that, and I did this because I'm motivated. And where does my motivation come from? It comes from a lot of places. It's really hard to define motivation. Uh, but I find one thing for me that's motivating is to, to think that I, I'm, I'm a role model for my family, for my for my son, for his wife, for their for their daughter, for my wife, for for the people around me in my life. I don't know if they're looking up to me or not, but I I assume I'm a role model to some extent for people, and I try to conduct myself in a way that makes me a good role model. And I, I will guarantee you, somebody in in your life. And it may not even be somebody you know, maybe somebody that's really a distant person from you at work or someplace looks up to you as a role model. Every person has looks up to you, somebody, every person has somebody looking up to them as a role model. Every person does. That's the starting place. I'm going to be the best role model I can be. That's that's my goal in life. I want to be a role model for my family, especially. If somebody else wants to, to uh, copy the same things I'm doing, that's great. But my family is where it starts. My, and it's, it's working really well. My family is very active. Um, it's it's a it's a great family to to deal with because we're we're very active people. We all get along. We, we're sociable. And we have fun. And it all starts with um, having somebody that kind of sets the standard. What is that standard? My son is now fifty four years old. Um, he started uh, racing when he was twelve years old. Uh, he'd seen me doing this. And he decided to do it. That's great. I didn't tell him to do it. He came to me and said, Dad, I'd like to do a race. So he did a race. He finished last in the race, 12 years old. But it was no big deal. We didn't care. He, he was having fun. That's what it was all about. He goes on to eventually win the state championship in, in Colorado, junior state championship. Beats, by the way, Bobby Julik, who was third on the, on the podium, what, 1998, I think. Um, in, in Tour de France, and then he goes from there to race in Europe. Um, it, it's after his senior year in high school, he goes to Europe, races on the U.S. national team, um, is finally picked up by an amateur team there, and then makes it to the pros in, in Europe. All because I was trying to be a role model for him. I, I was trying to do things that I knew would be, I would like to see him do. And so I, I focused my life on him. And I do the same thing with everyone around me. I kind of focus my life on them. I want them to, um, to see me as somebody who's doing the right things, good things, and try to mimic me in whatever way those things may be, however they interpret that, that, that they keep on doing these things. So we have this great little family because, of, uh, because we all see ourselves as role models. 
And my son sees himself as a role model. My daughter-in-law sees herself as a role model. My wife sees herself as a role model. And we try to help one another as best we can all the way through our lives, no matter what the issue may be. Exercise is just one little part of this.